It's great to be here. It's so much fun to be a part of this, and it's fun to be uh, here in this moment, 125th anniversary, uh, almost to, to the date. It was earlier this month. So the Columbian Exposition, uh, as, as you all know, I'm sure, it was a very important moment in American history. There was a nexus of a lot of different things happening. And I'm not going to talk about those. You've had your hot dogs, so you know some of what happened, right? But uh, what I want to talk about is the music at the fair. And, um, <clears throat> and this, of course, is hard to, um, to replicate, uh, and it's hard to imagine. We see photographs of the fair. We have uh, you know, plans of what was happening. But it, we, it's hard to get a sense of what the sound was like. And largely because a lot of most of this music has not been recorded. And so uh, you're going to have a special treat tonight. You're going to hear some of this music for almost the first time uh, in over 100 years. Um, the, the fair, as you might know, attracted over 20 million visitors. And uh, at a time when the population of the United States was about 60 million. So, uh, and of course, not all of these were American, but something like a third of uh, the American population attended the fair. And so the sheer exposure of music to the population must have been astounding. Uh, there was daily concerts, multiple concerts every day. Um, Theodore Thomas, who was the founder of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, was the music director, and he uh, put on concerts regularly. John Philip Sousa was at the fair. Uh, and then there are concerts all scattered throughout. There were three main places where you would hear music, or at least I divided into three uh, chunks. There was the fairgrounds proper. Actually, I need to, I need to show some slides, so there we go. So here's a map of the fair. Um, so famously, the, uh, to the left, you'll see the Midway Plaisance, which was uh, the, the thing that really saved the fair financially and had all these little villages which were, had a taste of the exotic for Americans, which was very exciting. So that's the second site for music at the fair. So the fairgrounds proper and then the Midway, which was, uh, had a, a very different flavor to it. And then there was the music heard outside of the fairgrounds, and there was a lot of people taking advantage of the, the huge influx of population in Chicago. And uh, in theaters, in bars, restaurants, there was tons of music going on. So uh, it, was, it, was very, it was filled with music. So the, um, in, in the fair itself, there were two main concert halls. So get a close-up of the front part of the fair. You'll see right at the, the head of the, the Great Lagoon was the music hall. And then a little bit farther away on this side was the choral hall. And these would seat thousands of people. These are huge venues. Of course, these were before the days of amplification. So this meant that the, they amassed gigantic performing forces, sometimes over a thousand performers for, for each of these things. But uh, to me, the most interesting part was the Midway. And the Midway uh, featured a lot of uh, what was, to Americans, very exotic music. And uh, I think this is fascinating, because this is where uh, Americans heard new sounds for the first time. And I, I thought I'd quote at length from uh, uh, a journalist who attended the fair and did not care for the music on the Midway. It is good for the pilgrim to go to the World's Fair if he have music in his soul and be moved by the concord of sweet sounds. Uh, not that the fair is entirely a bed of roses, however, for there is a most awful cacophony to be heard upon the Midway plaisance. There are two or three authentic and awful bagpipers caterwauling attention to one of their sideshows. Then there are a Turkish orchestra, an Egyptian orchestra, and an Algerian orchestra, all three of the same model, comprising a giant mandolin and a violin played like a cello and drums beaten by hand. Yea, there is a Chinese orchestra. Nay, there are two Chinese orchestras, one in the theater and one outside, calling attention to the performance, each one more terrible than the other. The Javanese orchestra is more consoling, consisting of mild flutes and an assortment of 
as it were, zithers, and a large, so to speak, violin, but they are all soft and inoffensive instruments. All the same, the lover of what the civilized modern man means by music will get little good out of the barbarous bands. So yeah, I like that picture because you can see the Ferris wheel at, at the head of the midway. So uh, when I started this project, I was uh, looking at the music that was uh, performed at the fair, and it, uh, it's fascinating. There's so much. And what actually piqued my interest the most was what I'm calling souvenir music. There were dozens and dozens of pieces of music published uh, for fairgoers as souvenirs. And of course, um, this being America, there's always somebody trying to make money out of this. So you could buy all sorts of souvenirs at the fair. Um, there were medallions, postcards, stamps, rings, clay pipes, uh, spoons, playing cards, uh, all sorts of things. Uh, and then there was sheet music. And uh, as I said, lots and lots of sheet music. This is the peak of American uh, parlor music. Um, all women, especially women, were expected to play the piano and um, provide entertainment for their families. So when people talk about the pop hits of the 1890s, they're referring to this. They're referring to the, the piano music. So um, if you went to the fair or if you just visited Chicago, you could go to music stores and you could find the sheet music for, for sale. And uh, the music came from three uh, different, different sources. One was actual music heard at the fair uh, that was either uh, piano music and you could buy a copy of what you heard or it was transcribed from something else. And then there was music that was heard at various other venues in Chicago, at vaudeville type uh, shows or restaurants or theaters, and these were sometimes transcribed for piano. And then the one that I'm most interested in is the music that was written by people uh, simply to capitalize on the fair mania and uh, didn't really have much co uh, connection to actual music that was heard. Most of these music that you'll hear tonight um, are are unfamiliar, and most of the tunes will be unfamiliar. But one tune might, you might recognize that was written by actually Saul Bloom, who was the promoter of the Midway, and uh, I'll ask Chris to play just a little bit of it. So it, it goes by various names, the Hoochie Coochie Dance, maybe. Um, you probably are coming up with lyrics in your head um, for this. Um, so we'll hear a taste of that. That was actually turned into a whole song, if you can believe that. Um, but here, let's, let's, let's go to some of our first music. Our first piece uh, that we've chosen, we have a whole collection of CD, uh, of music on our CD, and you're welcome to, to take one home and if you want to listen to more of, more of this music. So um, this is one piece that we, we've recorded, <clears throat> the Viking March. And um, this is kind of a, has a historical curiosity to me. Uh, one of the, the things going on at this time was this uh, debate about whether Columbus discovered America or Leif Erikson. Um, the Viking, <coughs> sorry, the Norwegians had uh, discovered the Gokstad ship in 1880 and were making the argument that this was an ocean-going vessel and that could, could, um, could, could have made its way to the New World and there were people that disbelieved it and didn't want to undermine Columbus's uh, role. So uh, Norway built an exact replica and sailed it from Norway to arrive at the fair all the way going through the Great Lakes. And it, it did so on July 12th. And uh, to prove the point, right? And uh, so and there was also a Norway day and a Sweden day uh, at the fair. And so, uh, and this ship actually still exists. It's in Galena, Illinois, as he said. So uh, let's, let's hear this.
I forgot to introduce Chris White, sorry. <laughs> Our next selection is Reha Dorada, which is um, called, called The Golden Gate. My daughter is here and is asking me, why is the, the Golden Gate? And I have no idea. Uh, it's not for the San Francisco Fair. But Mexico Day was uh, October 4th. And uh, this is a Mexican composer. And so uh, it's kind of... Uh, Interesting, uh, to me this is probably uh, written to capitalize on the Mexico Day. So uh, the Chicago Day was close to the end of the fair. It was October 9th. <clears throat> and um, I, I find a, a lot of these, uh, these pieces to have sort of a similar quality to them, the pop sound of the 1890s. You'll notice that somewhere on here, yes, the Valisi brothers. Uh, this is the most common name among these composers. And uh, I've never heard of him before I started this project. And, uh, but he composed a lot of this music, capitalizing this. He was also the publisher. And I learned by doing a little bit of digging that many of these composers actually are pseudonyms. So uh, they had some sort of more respectful uh, day job or something like that. But they, I think they must have made some money out of this, though. So this is the Chicago Day Waltz in honor of Chicago Day.
they're not very creative with titles, are they? <clears throat> we chose to uh, present this tonight because this is uh, the only piece on our program by a woman composer. Um, <clears throat> Lillian Mathewson was a Canadian composer, and uh, this was uh, written in commemoration of the Women's Building. As you may know, uh, this one of the famous sites of the fair was the Women's Building, uh, spearheaded by Bertha Palmer, who was quite a formidable character in the fair. And um, this, the uh, unveiling of the building included a concert uh, of all women composers, which is pretty striking for the 1890s. And um, the building was designed by a woman architect and uh, it featured artwork, artwork by Mary Cassatt and other women artists. So, um, and then they would hold talks and uh, forums by women for women. So it was very uh, striking for this time. So here is the Colombian polka by uh, Lillian Mathewson. I could have turned pages for you. <clears throat> so, uh, one of the most tantalizing stories for musicologists about the fair 
was our awareness that um, Scott Joplin was, was here at the fair. Um, <clears throat> it's pretty clear he was here. We have reports that he actually formed a little band. He played cornet, and he also played piano at the fair. Uh, this is uh, six years before the Maple Leaf Rag was published, which was his first ragtime publication. Uh, but he was clearly playing music all the way through this period. So, uh, and we also know that ragtime originated with uh, composers taking pre-existing marches and other kinds of pieces and syncopating them and ragging them. So uh, Chris and I were talking about this, and we thought it'd be interesting to demonstrate what Scott Joplin might have done with one of these pieces. So this is, uh, this is not, of course, authentic. We don't know <laughs> if Scott Joplin picked this piece to rag, as they would say. But it gives you a sense of the kind of thinking that might have gone on at the time. So uh, can we hear what the original sounded like? So let's hear the same strain a la Joplin. <laughs> brief advertisement, Chris White is a fabulous jazz pianist and he plays all over town, so chriswhite.com, is that right? Uh, chriswhitepiano.com. Chris chriswhitepiano.com, you can hear, you can check out what he's up to. So, yes. <clears throat> so, uh, of course, uh, Neapolitan songs are, are, are always popular. There were gondolas on the Grand Lagoon and uh, this is uh, the Valisi brothers again. So um, we, I, I thought we would invite Kate Carter, our violinist, up to uh, perform three, a collection of three Neapolitan love songs for you.
<laughs> this was probably the most popular song in our collection. This was actually, this is the only song that we know of that was recorded. This was recorded on a wax cylinder in 1895. And apparently Bonnie Thornton was quite the star um, at, at this period. Um, so this features the common trope of the 19th century, the city as a corrupting influence on young women coming from the countryside. And uh, this is the song I was telling you that uses the famous Hoochie Coochie tune. So I'd like to invite Brad Jungworth to come and sing this song for us. And of course, we have to have songs about the Ferris wheel. It wouldn't be complete. Um, <clears throat> this is another Valise number. And uh, so I'll just. Thank you. 
This is not the same song. This, that was the Ferris wheel waltz. This is the song of the Ferris wheel, okay. They're different. They're very different. Um, <clears throat> this one is actually more about the view that you get of the midway from the top of the Ferris wheel. Thank you. 
Our final number tonight is the Midway Plaisance, which was a comic song first premiered in a musical not long after the fair. So it's about a hapless fellow who finds frustration at various Midway attractions. Night 
team and figured up my check. Ten twenty-five. I met a little girl with romance. I knew dear to her this was dear to her. But when I said I broke the circumstance, made her up and leave me on the pleasant midway pleasant midway pleasant. I thought I'd die when they let her fly. Midway pleasant midway pleasant. I'll hear them fly. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the show. And um, uh, do we have time for questions? We do have time for a few questions, just a few. Please raise your hand and I'll bring the mic to you. Or just comments. I'd like to hear what you think of the, the music from this time. Anyone? Right here? Actually, you are. I, oh. Just come on up. <laughs> I was going to ask about Ragtime and Joplin, but then you mentioned him. But So can we say that the 1893 World's Fair influenced Ragtime and jazz to follow? Was there much of a connection? And was there any presence of jug band music at the fair? I don't really know about jug band music. Chris, do you know? That's probably later, but... Um, I'm wondering, is there, is there a historical connection between the fair and the rise of jazz and jazz forms? Uh, it, it's, it's too tenuous to know for sure, but uh, we know that uh, Buddy Bolton was making music right around that time in New Orleans, and, so it, and Scott Joplin was playing. Um, and I'm pretty sure he wasn't playing just straight music. I mean, uh, I, I'm pretty sure it was syncopated. So a lot of it, so much of jazz was improvised and so much of it was a, an oral tradition that it's hard to know exactly. Things don't get written down. It's really to the rise of recordings and the recording industry after World War I that we start to get the first real recorded artifacts of jazz. So unfortunately, there's a big, there's kind of a, a black hole in, in the first 20 or 30 years where we don't know quite what was going on with jazz. And a lot of people would love to take a time machine and be able to hear you know, exactly what was going on there. Do you have anything you can add to that, Chris? <laughs> OK, good. Um, I think Scott Joplin was at the World's Fair in St. Louis in 1904, and that he did do the ragtime. And it was a big hit, and things right. went on from there. So it was at the next World Fair. Yeah, that's, I, that's true. By that time, he had a number of pieces published, too. I heard that there's uh, three buildings left remaining from the Midway, and that would be the Art Institute, the Field Museum, and the Science and Industry. Is that correct? The, the, I think the Field Museum was... That yeah. was later? Yeah, so the Museum of Science and Industry is the only building that I know of now, somebody told me that the Japanese pavilion, do you know the answer to that? The Japanese pavilion was moved, but it was... It but was then it burned, didn't it? It was the Pavilion. Oh, okay, that's right. It's in Jackson Park, right? Okay. And the Art Institute was built at the same time. It wasn't part of the fair. Yeah, that's right. The Art Institute was built downtown. But in terms of the buildings, just so you understand, the Art Institute was built for the fair. Uh, what, okay. The World Congresses were there during the six months of the fair, and as far as MSI, the MSI building, that is a rebuild. Oh, okay. It was taken down to the ground. It was a very temporary structure. And the Japanese pavilion was, in fact, destroyed by fire in the 1940s. Okay. But there are panels on the Art Institute from it. Oh, okay. There's we have time for one more question. Up here. Up here? Oh, just one second, so everyone can hear. <laughs> Hi, any que uh, connection between Coochie Coochie, which was the way it was spelled up here, and Hoochie Coochie, which I think is the way it was sung. Yes. <laughs> I, 
I, th I think it's an interesting moment because it wasn't quite fixed yet what they were going to call it, right? So coochie coochie, hoochie coochie, it was sort of anything goes. It became kind of a folk song and it morphed into hoochie coochie. Where did it come from? Where did this term hoochie coochie come from? It was the term for belly dancing, that's all I know. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. That was the first experience of belly dancing in, in the United States, though. Okay, let's give Don Meyer and our musicians another round of applause. Thank you so much.